This month's Where'd the Road Go is sponsored by four awesome people. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Indrid Cold, and 36 Dingo. If you want to become a patron, www.wheredtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have back with me, Mr. Travis Watson. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Soraya. Nice to be back. And you have this awesome new book out. You have another book already in the time that it took me to read this one. Uh, Canadian Monsters and Mysteries that came out on, uh, what was the, uh, uh, Into the Fray? Beyond, Beyond the Fray Publishing. Beyond the Fray, okay. Yep. And uh, I loved this book. I will say that right away. Well, I'm always glad to hear that. <laughs> it makes me happy when I know that, that there are, you know, paranormal geeks like me out there reading the book and having fun. It um it puts me in the mind of stuff like the you know stuff from John Keel or stuff from Brad Steiger. You have a nice collection of weirdness here. You throw out some fun speculation, uh, and it's an easy read. It's not like something you got to trog through. It's not seven hundred pages or anything like that. So it's fun to read on top of being a good collection of interesting cases. Yeah, I try to um you know, as I as I mentioned earlier when we were talking before the show I I have been around for quite a while and uh, you know i grew up reading things like frank edwards stranger than science and strange world and stuff like that some of the brad steiger books um you know i discovered john keel later on but i really love those compendium paranormal books that just give you a whole broad range of interesting stories about things that make you go huh um, so that's kind of my inspiration and, and, and I wanted to, you know, I, I want to, when I write a book, write something that's fairly easily digestible for people, but provide them with, uh, you know, enough bibliography and so forth to be able to go and, and look at whatever it is deeper if they, if they really want to. Right. Right. Well, let, let, let's talk about some of the stuff here in the book. One of the things you mentioned, uh, was a supposedly extinct animal, the wood bison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the early 1900s, um, the wood bison, which is, by the way, the largest land animal in North America by weight. Um, now, moose are taller, obviously, but the bison is, is meatier, <laughs> ah, okay. if you want to put that. So these guys were basically pronounced uh, extinct due to uh, overhunting, brucellosis, and so forth in the early part of the, the 20th century. Back in the uh, the fifties, a uh, forestry officer with, I believe, uh, the province of Alberta was on a flight um, going from one place to another, and lo and behold, looked down and there was a whole herd of bison down there. <laughs> so Canada has its own Lazarus, you know. Canada has its own Lazarus species. We actually had a species that was declared extinct, but then was rediscovered in in the the wilds of of, of Canada and. And this is a point that I make in the book, probably in the introduction and throughout the book and in the afterword and so forth. Is this is the second largest country in the world. It has more coastline than any other country in the world. And the vast majority of the population here lives within 150 miles of the American border. So there, there are these huge swaths of wilderness that, um, that very few people live in. Very few people, even some people, even uh, very few people even venture into. You know, we have places like Snell Grove Lake in northern Ontario, um, which um, you, act, you the only way you can get there is to fly in. Oh. Um, so, you know, there's these vast swaths of wilderness. So there's there's all kinds of, of place for interesting uh, critters to, to hang out. Uh, and that's... Uh, you know, a point that I try to make throughout the book. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, well, that couldn't happen. That, you know, there's every place in the world is populated and there are people everywhere. No, not really. No. <laughs> I can drive two hours north of where I'm sitting right now and be in, in 
dense wilderness. Well, that's why I even give the the possibility of a great ape in in the Pacific Northwest a a possible you know mark because there's places there that people have probably never walked. Yeah, yeah. There's there's places in in you know the northern parts of Canada where I guarantee you that the only people that might have might might have been you know through that area were indigenous peoples who were you know migrating from one place to the other. Yeah. Um, otherwise, there's large swaths of this this country that are are basically unpopulated. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm not. Uh, yeah. I, I'm open to the possibility that there might be a, a, a relic hominid or bipedal ape species that, that lives in, in, you know, the north of, of the Great White North. Um, I, I've, you know, come to the conclusion after reading some stories, though, that you know, there's definitely some strangeness that's involved with these creatures as well. Yeah. And, you know, so I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm a both and thinker. So I'm entirely okay. If somebody actually produced a body one day, I wouldn't be like, Oh no, my, my, my thought had, my theory has been completely debilitated. Because right. Even a body doesn't explain some of the weird stuff that has yeah. happened around yeah. Sasquatch sighting. So well, that's your next book. But, um, yeah, that's my, that's the, the book after this one. <laughs> um, there were, one of the things that happened, I moved to Canada in 2020. Uh, my spouse got a job at the University of Waterloo, and um, we decided to make the uh, make the trek up here. Um, Stacy's a, a native Canadian, was born uh, in this area, so um, you know it was a, a homecoming for them. Uh, but um, you know, of course, I get up here. I'm waiting for my papers and all that stuff to come through. I, 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 I'm not able to work. So I thought, well, this is a good time to find out what kind of weird things happen in Canada, <laughs> being, who, being who I am. Uh, so uh, I started doing some preliminary research and I quickly found that I was going to have to to pare things down because there was so much stuff that I just couldn't uh, – I just couldn't include it all in one book or it would be 700 pages and, and, you know, have all kinds of, of have, have to have probably a whole volume just for the bibliography. Right. Um, right. So I deliberately didn't do Sasquatch in this book and um, I did deliberately didn't do ghosts and hauntings. That's another thing. I, I think that there's probably a, a book on, on hauntings and, in, in, you know, maybe just in Ontario. <laughs> It's really dense. Uh, there's lots of, of ghost lore up here. So, mm. But I, I didn't do those things. So I instead focused on just general Fortean strangeness and cryptids and all kinds of fun stuff that you can find when you start doing research on Canada. So uh, the next story here that, that I, I marked down was the Ceratoris. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is, you know, like 1800s. Um, and, you know, we get this story from uh, a gentleman who was supposedly there. Um, he had, had uh, if I'm recalling the story correctly, he had uh, actually encountered some, some native folks. Oh, no, actually, he was out on a moose hunt. That's what yes. it was. Yes, yeah, it was a moose hunt. Um, he, was, he was out on a moose hunt, and um, they actually observed some moose, and all of a sudden, the moose bolted. And this is not typical moose behavior. You know, people who, you know, if you live more than 30 seconds in Canada, you're, somebody warns you about moose. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you're liable to run into them when you get a little bit farther north uh, than I am. And, uh, you know, having a, a, a close encounter with a moose in your car can be a fatal event if yeah. you, you know, aren't careful. Because they'll take the top right off your car. Right. Um, and they are um, pretty recalcitrant about getting out of the way. Uh, they're, they're pretty much of the assumption that they have the right of way wherever they go. <laughs> so, um, and they're big enough to back it up. You know, nobody's going to mess with a moose. Um, but in this particular case, these moose fled, and which is unusual behavior in, in itself. And when these guys came up to where the moose had been, they found this huge depression in the ground and, and these huge tracks with, with long claw, mark, uh, claw uh, marks on them. And they're like, what the heck? So they go back to the local village and, um, you know, the, the, the local, basically local trading post wasn't really a village. Go back to the trading post and the, the local uh, padre and, and another person joins their party. And, of course, they're quite skeptical about this. And 
they go out into the, the tundra and they're, they're bebopping around looking for any sign of this thing. And of course, as so often happens in these stories, they're unable to find the tracks. They're unable to find the depression. They can't find the place they were before. And, um, you know, they're setting up camp. They've had a long day monster hunting. They're preparing a meal when all of a sudden they hear this god awful roar. And I always, you know, whenever I, I read this story, you know, the, the thing that pops into my head is, is Godzilla. You know? Right. <laughs> that, that belling roar that, that you get in the, in the old Godzilla movies, right? <laughs> now, I don't know if that's what it sounded like. But that's kind of what plays in my head. That's yeah, the, the yeah. audio in my head. Um, and they're like, what the heck? So they're, they look down into the um, um, fjord or depression or uh, little valley, valley let, I guess, that this comes from. And they see this creature, uh, this giant lizard type creature, you know, with the big paws and the big teeth. And, and it's coming up, <laughs> it's coming up the side of the mountain. Now. And they're, you know, they're just, of course, they're paralyzed with fear yeah um yeah. and uh the the priest identifies this creature as a ceratosaurus which is a, a bipedal uh early precursor to the, the tyrannosaurs right it's oh. a it's a bipedal carnivore dinosaur you're like okay all right so these guys claim that they saw a dinosaur and you know long story short is this creature comes up the 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 the, uh, the little valley uh, toward them uh, but bypasses them and goes on its way um you know and they're all probably breathing a sigh of relief because even with moose hunting guns i i don't know that i'd be particularly willing to take on a, you know 30 or 50 foot dinosaur <laughs> right uh, you know I mean, first of all, where do you shoot it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Hopefully the um, soft underbelly. Yeah. Something like that. Right. So, you know, they of course decide that discretion is a better part of valor and beat feet out of there. They get back in their canoes and they go back to their trading post. And that's pretty much the end of the story, except that the, the Frenchman who's writing it, <clears throat> you know, he tries to get the, uh, the local provincial government interested in going on a dinosaur hunt. And they basically laugh him out of their offices um, he goes back to France, but he continues corresponding with this priest at this trading post. And he gets a letter from the guy that says that, that, that he and, and 10 uh, native people actually saw the thing again. Wow. Um, and then, of course, you know, it vanishes into the, the smoky annals of history and we don't hear anything more about it. But if you think about it, it's like a dinosaur is supposed to be a reptile. You know? And even though there are some people now who theorize that you know, dinosaurs were actually warm blooded creatures. Yeah. Any way you look at it, a dinosaur is not set up for survival in that kind of climate. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking, uh, we're talking far Northern Canada in the tundra and it, it, it's just not feasible for a creature that's not, um, you know, furred and, and, um, and insulated to survive the winters there. Yeah. You know, so are these guys migrating down to Florida for, <laughs> you know, for, for, um, for the winter or, you know, how, how does that work? Um, you know, so it's one of those things where you, you start thinking, okay, well, you know, after reading Mr. After doing the research for mysteries in the mist, I'm perfectly willing to believe that there are creatures coming through time slips and stuff that, sure. that could account for some of this stuff. Right. Um, you know, and certainly there's plenty of, of large game for a dinosaur to eat yeah. um, in, in those areas. They got moose and, and, you know, you get farther north, you got musk ox and things like that too. Um, so, you know, I mean, but you know, you just don't, it, it's hard to fathom the idea of a dinosaur existing that far north. You know, it, it'd be, you know, we think of Mokele Membe, Membe in, in Africa and the swamps in Africa. So that seems like where a dinosaur ought to live, right? It, not in Canada. <laughs> well, not only that, there have so, to be enough to keep a breeding population going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, not only would you, you know, would it be hard for a single dinosaur to exist in that area, but you'd have to have a whole, you know, you'd have to have several of them to, to keep having dinosaurs around, right? <laughs> um, so the whole whole story was just bizarre, yeah. you know, and it's it, it's not like, um, you know, it, it's not like there would be a situation where, uh, 
you know, somebody would just kind of make this kind of a story up. Why on, or why would you make up a story about seeing a dinosaur in Canada? I mean, if you were going to make up a story about something in Canada, you know, giant polar bears or something, yeah, right? Or, yeah. or, you know, talk a little bit about the Wahila, the giant wolves later in the book, you know. Uh, that seems much more likely to be a Canadian thing, right? Dinosaurs, though, it's like, yeah. where did that come from? <laughs> you know? So you have one here about a, a panther, a large black panther that stood upright. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a scary story. Um, I'm trying to think. Was that in Nova Scotia? No, that wasn't Nova Scotia. It was New Brunswick or someplace like that. Yeah, um, yes, it was in New Brunswick. It came out New of uh, Jerome, yeah. Cl- Jerome Clark's Unexplained. Right. You said you found it. Yeah, so so this fellow was was walking along. He was going back, back to his house. And um, this is what, an interesting little tidbit from the story that that made me go hmm i wonder why he did that he stops and um he's carrying his axe he'd been out cutting wood right he stops and he he flaks his axe against a, a fence post and i'm like okay well why would you do that you know that just seems like an odd thing so i wonder if it was you know it seems it makes me wonder if there wasn't a local superstition about that um, in any case, he's going along further, and he hears something shadowing him in the trees, and you're thinking, ah, Bigfoot, right? Oh, nope, not a Bigfoot. Um, he's, you know, continues to walk along, and this thing comes out of the woods, and he realizes he's being followed by basically a, a big black panther. And, uh, he's like, okay, <laughs> the, this is not a creature that's indigenous to that area, okay? Right. Um, there's... There's certainly uh, uh, puma, uh, mountain lions, whatever you want to call them, um, in Canada, but those aren't melanistic. Uh, they're, they're not black. So this creature, whatever it was, starts following him. And then as he's going along, it, it comes at him. And this is where it gets really weird. The thing stands up on its back legs and it's coming at him, swinging its paws at him. Yeah. You know? He describes it as being about six feet tall. And it's got like a short tail, not a real long tail. Um, and it's it's coming at him with with claws and you know two handed. You know, like a, I picture it almost like a boxer coming at him. You know, with, with the claws. Um, and he, he swings his axe at it, and the thing takes off. And he, you know, of course, continues on his way rapidly. So this happens like three times before he finally gets back to his house. You know, the thing comes at him, it gets up on its hind legs, it comes at him, and he swings his axe at it, and it goes away, and then he you know, goes a little further, and then it comes again. He finally makes it back home, um, and, you know, as soon as he gets to within the lights of his home, the thing fades off into the forest and goes away. But again, you know, weird enough seeing a big black cat. It's even weirder when it decides to stand up on its yeah. back legs and come at you. Now, you know, it, it makes you think of all those those dog man slash man wolf stories. Is, uh, what, are the felines trying to get in on this act or what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, but, what's, yeah, it, what strikes me is, okay, so when the, when the guy experienced this, it was clearly out of place. This is, you know, mm-hmm. not only was it, was the animal out of place, but obviously its behavior was very strange. Mm-hmm. But how many times do you think we could encounter perfect, what seem like perfectly normal animals that aren't, mm-hmm. you know, like because yeah. they're not behaving weird or they don't seem out of place, we just assume, oh, that's just a whatever, you know, we have them everywhere, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people who are not, you know, super zoological, zoo, zoologically savvy who might see a black, a big black cat, you know, in, in the woods and think, oh, well, you know, that's like a mountain lion or, or something and, and not think anything of it. Not understanding that the mountain lion is not a melanistic species. The only melanistic species of big cat that we have on, on this side of the ocean is, um, is a jaguar. Right. Um, and there have been recorded melanistic jaguars in you know, places like Texas and so forth. Um, what a melanistic jaguar would be doing in Canada, that would be quite a migration. And then you have the whole business of it standing on its back legs. It's right. like, okay, so the one clue to the weirdness in this one is the, the, the guy swinging his axe at it and it, it bailing out. Now, anybody who studies fairy lore, of course, knows that that uh, the fae are allergic to cold iron. Right. Um, so maybe he encountered some kind of a weird cough she, you know? <laughs> 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 um, you know, or 
like I said, you know, maybe the cats are trying to get into the dog man business. You know, they thought that was fun and they decided <laughs> they would do it too. Um, just no talent. There's just no talent. You know, it's one of the fun things about these stories is you can conjecture until the cows come home, but you really don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, that one, you know, the black thing. cat things are interesting to begin with. Uh, mm-hmm. But then, like this one being especially odd is why it stood out to me. Um, yeah, yeah. You talk about yeah, uh, go ahead. you talk about giant snakes uh, as oh, well, yeah. and the First Nation people's warnings, which I found very interesting. Yeah, so um, there's a, a guy named John Worms up here in Canada, Manitoba, um, who wrote this wonderful book called "Strange Creatures Seldom Seen." And for anybody who's interested in Canadian cryptid lore, I highly, and, and he talks a little bit about the, the little people too. Um, I highly recommend this book because it's, 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 as far as I know, it's only available from like his website as like a PDF or, or that kind of thing. But I actually was impressed enough to, I, you know, I actually bought a copy of this book because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, there's just all kinds of fun stuff in here. Um, uh, so Worms seems to have had uh, a real in with the uh, the native folk in, in, in Manitoba. And um, so he went down this rabbit hole because he was he started off researching these weird holes um, that people were finding in, you know, wilderness areas. So they were like three feet in diameter. They were smooth sided. Um, they extended for, for long, you know, for yards and yards and yards um, underground, right? He was like... Just puzzled because he he got ge- geologists to look at these things and they couldn't explain them. And, um, he couldn't come up with a workable theory for how these things, these holes, were actually being formed um, until he asked one of his native friends about it, and they they just kind of shrugged and said, "Well, you know, that's where the giant snakes live." <laughs> oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and he's like, "What giant snake?" And now understand that in his home home province, there are five known species of snake, and none of them are very large. Um, and we're talking about snakes that are anaconda size or bigger, right? Um, being reported, and you know the native people are very blasé about these things. Like, oh yeah, you know, I was I was in my boat, and um, you know. Uh, you know, I was in my boat and I bumped into one of these things in the lake and it was, you know, 20 or 30 feet long. It was as long as my boat or whatever. Um, you know, there's a story in the book about two firefighters who uh, were doing a brush clearing and, and came across one of these snakes that stretched from one side of the clearing to the other. All they could see was the body of the snake. They couldn't see the head or the tail. <laughs> Yeah, and they're they're debating what they should do about it. And the one is like, well, maybe we should, you know, maybe we should kill this thing and and you know so that people can see it. And right. The other the other guy is like, no, 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 no. That would be really bad because the elders tell them if you see one of these things, you don't talk about it, you don't approach it, you don't do anything with it. It's a mystery, and you need to leave it that way. Mm. You know, it's just just don't mess with it. Right. Yeah. Um. But the weird thing about it is it's not just one kind of snake either. You know, you get descriptions of things that sound like giant garter snakes. You get descriptions of snakes that have like flat heads and stuff. There's even a description of one snake that a guy saw, uh, you know, they're typically seen along riverbanks and stuff like that, uh, that had horns like a deer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Um, So, you know, you don't, you know, on the one hand, you know, everybody's so okay. You know, John Warren's talking about the, the 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 snakes, and they're living in the in the, in these giant holes. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, you're 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 talking about a creature that really shouldn't exist up here. Um, the 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 herpetologist that he consulted with said that you know the only reason that the snakes that do live in that area survive is is because they're small and they can hibernate in the wintertime. Right. Uh, so there's no good reason for there to be giant snakes in Canada. You know, I, yes. I mean, it's one thing to believe that there might be relic titanoboas in, in the Amazonian basin somewhere. But it's another thing to believe that there might be a snake that size up here in Canada. But they definitely, you know, the native population in that area definitely, they're very, 
matter of fact about the idea that these snakes actually exist. And given the number of lake monster sightings we have in Canada, you have to wonder if there's not some, you know, Venn diagram where the, the two things come together and some of those lake monsters are actually these giant snakes. Yeah. Because um, they are seen around water a lot. Um, um, and there's, there's a lot of water in Canada to be seen around, too. There's huge amounts of water, yes. Um, you know, lots and lots of deep, cold water lakes. But the other funny thing, and this is probably my favorite thing in the book, is, you know, so John Worm starts collecting giant snake stories, and he finds a number of people who've seen these creatures, right? He's like, oh, okay, all right, well, they're giant snakes. He's like, wait a minute, snakes don't typically dig. You know, they usually occupy burrows that are already made. So he went back to his native informants and he asked them, so who's digging the things? Who's digging these tunnels? And again, they very matter-of-factly tell him, oh, well, that's the giant beavers. (laughs) So now he's stuck with beavers the size of black bears. Right. Um, that are supposedly digging these these tunnels. And he's getting sightings reports from people all over the province who are telling him, yeah, oh yeah, you know, I saw John Beaver. The interesting thing about it is he had a sighting himself. Um, he was camped out along the, I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation on this, the Cinnaboyne River, um, it, which where he had been investigating a recent giant beaver sighting. And, you know, he's sitting along the river and he's thinking, oh, I'm just going to have a good time camping. I'm not going to see anything really because, you know, these things are really rare and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden he hears splashing in the river and he looks down and there's a there's a beaver head the size of a basketball popped out of the river <laughs> along with, the you know, the, the, the you know, kind of characteristic hump and the tail. Like this creature was something like seven feet long. Am. Uh, by his estimation. Now, this is one of those things where I, I have to wonder, you know, because the beaver is certainly native to this region. There was 10,000 years ago a giant beaver that lived in the, you know, the Ohio area and, and further north. It was, uh, I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation again, Costarides ohioensis. Okay. It, which was literally, which is literally as big as the kind of beavers that they were talking about. Now, of course, they're saying, oh, well, these beavers are extinct. But then so is the wood bison. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. You know, I mean, I, I'm a whole lot more uh, willing to believe that there's, you know, giant beavers in, in the, the, the rivers of Canada than I am, you know, than, than the whole giant snake thing. It's like, I just, I can't understand how a giant snake could exist here. But a beaver, I could see. <laughs> yeah, well, the giant snake may not be a real animal either. That's the other thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? Because um, there are certainly um, certainly legends of, of giant snakes in the the, the native lore that uh, that are are mythical creatures, and you know, I, we don't know. We don't know how the whole myth archetype thing works and whether or not it can project itself into our our real world kind of. Um, view of things sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, these sightings of giant snakes may actually be some kind of psychic experience. Who knows? Right. Right. So, um, you talk mm-hmm. about a story of a giant wolf, uh, that Linda mm-hmm. Godfrey wrote about that. I th- if I remember right, they shot at it, but it ran when they took a camera out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're, we're kind of diverging a couple of different stories here. Um, the, the giant wolf that exists up here in northern Canada is a, or supposedly a giant white wolf is called the Wahila. Um, and uh, its most famous hunting ground is something called the Nahani Valley, which is also called the Headless Valley. Um, and uh, there's one good story from Ivan Sanderson about, about these, this creature where this, this fellow, this mechanic, was off hunting with a native guide in, in the valley. Um, his friend, his guide went around to see if he could flush some prey in his direction. And this thing, this giant wolf that was three and a half or four feet at the shoulder um, comes out of the, out of the brush. Well, he, un- he unloads on this thing with a 12 gauge shotgun, I believe, uh, loaded with, with, uh, you know, not just, it was loaded with, uh, you know, like buckshot or whatever. Uh, I don't remember exactly what, what the load was, but it should have done some damage, right? Um, and this critter just kind of shrugs it off and walks back into the brush. Um, so 
in, in the Linda Godfrey crossover there is uh, she reports several sightings in Wisconsin. This is one of the few times I've ventured outside of Canada. She had several sightings in Wisconsin of what she called a bear wolf. Um, in one of these, uh, one of these stories, she talks about a guy who's driving along a snowy night. If I remember right, he was actually taking his wife to the hospital because she was in labor. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this, this creature runs up a giant, you know, wolf thing runs up next to the car and, and tries to bump it with his shoulder. Like it's trying to get them off the road. Um, Long story short, you know, it gets bumped by the car, gets kind of tangled with the car and, and goes cartwheeling off into the snow. Um, and of course, Godfrey, you know, may she rest in peace, um, had a couple of theories about what it could be, including the dire wolf, which is an actual thing from, you know, from not too long ago geologically. It's also something called an amphicyon, which seems to me a much better candidate. You know, if there's going to be a relic population of something, um, for, for this bear wolf or wahila kind of creature. Um, again, you know, I can't fathom the idea that there's a, you know, a relic population of giant wolves <laughs> running around in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, I could see it up in the far north here, but in Wisconsin, I, I don't know about that. I, I have to wonder if they're not popping through interdimensional portals right, or something. Right, right. So the, the, the story, uh, yeah. the camera part. Uh, the other story is a man-wolf story, yeah. Um, and same kind of, of, of situation. Well, not same kind of situation. These two people had gone, um, let's see, these two people had gone hiking. I think they were actually hunting a little bit because the, the husband was carrying a, a twenty two rifle. Yeah, it says cross country uh, skiing. Okay, yeah. Uh, and he but, was carrying a, a he, rifle. Yeah, he did have a twenty two. Yeah. And and as they're they're going along through a wooded area, they spot this enormous black wolf. Um, they're like, "Whoa, dude, that's the biggest wolf I've ever seen!" Right? Um, so naturally, they're they're kind of keeping an eye on this thing, and um, it's following them. And you know, so they're starting to get a little nervous about this critter because it's it's you know it's it's not not looking happy and it's looking aggressive, and they're. They're not sure what's going on. Um, they, as I recall, ski out into uh, kind of a clear area, and the, the, the wolf is is standing on uh, on the, the edge of the, the the wooded area, and it stands up on two legs, <laughs> or actually, the wolf is yeah, and it stands up on two yes. legs. Yep, yep, which is not typical wolf behavior. <laughs> right. Um, the um, the man, of course, you know. Fires a shot at the at this creature uh, at its feet, trying to get it to, to run away. Right again, the the impression that the woman got was that the wolf looks at him like you don't really think you can take me with that thing, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and um, so you know, it's standing there, it's growling, it's being ferocious, it's doing the typical dog man thing, right? It's being ferocious and, and scary. Uh, the guy puts a round into the, the into a tree next to its head. That really ticks it off, apparently. Um, and it starts to approach them, and he opens fire on this creature in earnest. He shoots it three times and, and is fairly sure he hits it in the chest. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes a loud sound and, and, and uh, bolts off into the woods. They, of course, beat feet in the other direction, and they go a ways, and then the thing shows up again and it's standing next to a tree and she starts to reach for her phone or her camera in the backpack. And she's suddenly overwhelmed by the thought that if she does that, it's going to kill them. Um, so she takes her hand out of her backpack and says, okay, yeah. no, problem. no problem. I'll just, uh, I'll just go somewhere else. <laughs> um, so, you know, they continue their, their, flight basically back to their car um, they have to to go through a wooded area um, again and they can hear something shadowing them but they don't actually see the creature again um so they get back to the car and of course they take off and, and you know they live to tell the story but I, I thought that you know this is this falls in line with some of the the sasquatch encounters that you read about where you know, people are going to reach for a camera or, or, you know, reach for a weapon or something and, and they get a very clear impression or even hear something speak in their mind that says, basically, you don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. If you do that, then I'm going to have to kill you. 
<laughs> well, the fir- the first story <laughs> the first story you told of these wolves here um, at the end. It's not that the thing went away. It's that uh, he said the man fired his shotgun in the air, and the wolf didn't seem to care. By this point, the witness was getting the feeling this was no ordinary wolf. Its behavior was bizarre, so the witness reached into his backpack for a camera. As soon as the witness oh, produced okay. the camera, the wolf darted into the woods. Yeah, I had my stories mixed up, I guess. Well, you, um, had, you had that one right, oh, except that at the end, that's when he pulls out the camera, and that's when the uh, wolf leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but if, in any event, you know, it's, it's just weird that, um, you know, that you have a situation where this creature doesn't seem to be afraid of firearms, but... It doesn't want to have its picture taken. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, why would that be? You know, um, and you can raise all kinds of crazy conjectures there. It, you know, in the whole, you know, bipedal wolf thing in and of itself is just bizarre. Yes. Um, you know, because, it, it, you know, Linda Godfrey over the course of her career posed any number of uh, different theories about what these creatures were, but none of them, you know, I, I mean, yeah, you know, I have to 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 um, think that that there's more of a supernatural explanation for these critters because I can't see where you know a, a wolf would find a benefit to a bipedal mutation. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's some people that theorize that that you know human beings developed bipedalism as a way of uh, improving their hunting and gathering, giving them farther range of vision and so forth. Um, but we sacrificed a lot of mobility doing yeah. that. Um, for a, a hunter predator like a wolf to go bipedal just doesn't make a lot of sense evolutionarily. Um, so then you're left with, okay, where do these things come from? Um, and you know, one of the things that, that I might consider is that, you know, a, there's this vast, um, um, treasure trove of werewolf lore over over the, the centuries. Yeah. It's like, okay, so what's up with that? Where did the, these ideas come from? There's there's obviously the belief that there was a supernatural creature that was once human and, and now isn't so human. You know, or you know, if you do some research into to, to magical lore, there are, um, for want of a better word, guardian spirits that look a whole lot like a man wolf. Um, so true. Who's to say? Who's to say that these things aren't, um, you know, in, in some way or the other. Uh, manifesting on our plane. What, what um, I love is at the end of the chapter, you make a reference to the TV show Primeval, which I loved. <laughs> yeah, I love that show. <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing that you can see happening sometimes. You know, it, it, it's like, because, you know, we see all this weird stuff, you know, these weird things happen. And then they're, it's almost like sometimes they're one offs. Yeah. It's like something flipped through an anomaly and then it went back to where it came from. Um, yeah, so that was an excellent show, and it was, I thought, I, I yeah. loved it. I love anything with dinosaurs in it, you know. It's like that's why I got such a kick out of the Ceratosaurus story, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was a dinosaur geek when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, it, it is one of those things that kind of puts you in mind of, you know, John Keel's window areas and the, the concept of portals and. You know, that kind of thing. And, you know, the the, the openings that, that are supposed to have, have appeared at Skinwalker Ranch and places like that. It's like, you know, we're pretty sure at this point with, uh, you know, physics and so forth that we live in a multidimensional universe. Who's to say what the hell lives in the other dimensions? You know? Right, right. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and we have a wide, wide, wide uh, testimony from... You know, your shaman, your magical practitioners, witches, and, and, and people who specialize in dealing with the other world about the various and sundry uh, beings that exist in that other world. Um, yeah. And, and how it is possible for some of these beings to move through what, what magicians call the etheric plane and gather substance to themselves and appear as physical beings in, in our in our um in our universe, in our, our plane of existence. Um, now, I don't think they hang around 
for very long, but you know, that's as good a theory as any for yeah. some of this stuff. I mean, when you start talking about man wolves, you know, you gotta, well, you gotta open your mind a little bit. The, the other thing is, I mean, the way our perception works, it, it compares, it, it compares new stuff to things we already know. Mm -hmm, so yeah, if we exactly. encounter something that is completely outside of anything we know, our brain's still going to go, I don't know, monster. What kind of monster would yeah. it be? I don't know. Wolf. It's a, it's a monster yeah, wolf, looks, you know? It looks like a werewolf. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and you we know, won't know because... Going, yeah, that's it. That's the ticket. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting the end result that our brain's going, this is a monster wolf, without realizing our brain's freaking out and going, I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, and if I'm going to go completely into the woo end of things, um, you know, if you talk to people who do spirit communication, mediums, and so forth... Um, they will tell you that a lot of times spirits will appear um, in a form that you can recognize. And when they don't, then your brain tries to give it some kind of shape. <laughs> right. You know, so, you know, yeah, it's very much a perceptual thing, too. It's like what you know, your brain is going, what am I looking at? <laughs> you know, and maybe your brain says, okay, that's a werewolf. Or maybe your brain says, oh, it's a giant bipedal hominid. <laughs> right, right. You know. You know? Maybe your brain tells you that, you know, you're seeing a, a, a being of smokeless fire. You know, who knows? I mean, your brain has a vast trove of uh, images to pull from just from your own memory. And if you believe that there's a collective unconscious, yeah. then it has, a, it has all of the, the images of all of mankind over all of history to pull from. Yeah. So... Yep. You know, um, it's just interesting that, that the things seem to kind of go in waves, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. People will, will see the, uh, whatever it is in, um, you know, it's like dog bin, you know, it's like Linda Godfrey's, you know, working at her little paper in, 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 uh, Elkhorn, Wisconsin in the 1990s. And, and all of a sudden the, the local animal control officer has a werewolf file. Um, <laughs> why do people suddenly start seeing these creatures in that area at that time? That to me is, is kind of the mystery. Is there, you know, is there a, 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 some kind of geomagnetic impulse that's causing people's brains to see these things, you know, or, or, uh, or allowing it, these did people an anomaly open and spit some out. I, who the hell knows? <laughs> or, or even allowing their brains to perceive more than normal. Um, yeah, yeah. But also yeah, there exactly. could be a co-creation aspect where the first person who sees it, mm -hmm. their brain goes monster, puts a shape on it, and now that, that thing now has sort of a form. So right. the next person who sees it then sees the form it was given by the first person. Yeah. And, and again, you know, you have the, the images that are out there that are available. Yeah. You know, think about the whole Slender Man thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, we went from, you know, a story on creepy pasta to people actually seeing this thing to, you know, kids actually trying to kill people in service to this. Right. Being, right. That, um, that's a whole different level. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, but, but it, it is, it is a fact though, that there are people who claim to have seen this entity. Yes. You know, when Absolutely. you know for a fact that it's a fictitious character, you know, the same kind of thing happens uh, in, in the house guy that wrote the shadow uh, radio series. There are people who claim to have seen the shadow uh, mm. in, in his house, yeah. right? Or being that looks like the shadow. Uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, there's so much of this stuff that is wrapped up in our perception, yeah. you know, and, you know, it's fun to think about, you know, interdimensional portals and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, I talk about um, in, in the Phantom Black Dog book, uh, I talk about how there is a situation in a lot of those sightings where a person is walking along uh, on a road, um, sometimes at night. So you have minimal um, uh, sensory stimuli, right? Um, and, and, and you're set up for that kind of relaxed brain state that enables sign. Yeah. And I'm convinced that some of the black dog sightings were, you know, psychic perceptions. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm convinced that some of these, uh, some of these other, you know, strange things that people report seeing were psychic perceptions. You know, I, I mean, there are a certain number of these things where whatever it is seems to interact physically with the environment. And then we have to, to kind of think about, okay, well, how does that happen? Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's, 
you, you know, you can get into real deep water when you start talking about human perception. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's move on to lake monsters a little bit. Um, talk, talk a little bit about Ogopogo, because there's actually a really interesting history there. I didn't know this history to this this creature. I just knew that it was a lake monster that, you know, mm-hmm. was seen. But uh, you go into the history a little, and uh, it's... Uh, yeah, so this this critter was in uh, is supposedly uh, in uh, Lake Okanagan in uh, British Columbia. Um, and yeah, the history goes back into at least the 1700s. Um, the the locals called it uh, Naitaka, I believe, um, which is basically like an evil spirit or you know the demon thing that lives in the lake or something along that line. Um, and the native people very quickly, the, the indigenous tribes of that area, very quickly developed the habit of making an offering to this creature before they tried to cross the lake. Um, and there's a story about um, uh, a visiting chief named Tim Basket, which I thought was a really interesting name, um, who was visiting with his family. And he decides that he's going to cross from one side of the lake to the other in his canoe. Um, and, you know, the locals told him, hey, you better make an offering to the, to the lake demon first. And he's like, whatever. So he mounts up and gets in his canoe with his wife and his child, I believe, maybe more than one child. Um, they get out to the middle of the lake, and, and long story short, they disappear into a whirlpool, whirlpool in, in the lake and, and are never seen again. Now, we'd think that that was just all native you know, mythic lore, right? But there's also a story from the 1800s about a guy named uh, McDonald or McDougall, um, I forget which. Um, He's going to take his team of horses from one side of the lake to the other to help another farmer with his haying. And um, the the white settlers in the area were already aware of this um, this creature, um, and some of them even took to uh, to carrying firearms with them when they went across the lake. Um, he was like, "Yeah, that's that's all a load of bunk, right?" So he's got his horses. You know, he's basically the, the horses are swimming behind the canoe. As he's crossing. And to his horror, he gets about halfway out in the middle of the lake again. And one of the horses disappears. Then another one disappears. And he's like, "Uh uh-oh. He cuts the line to the horses and it escapes. But all of his horses are are consumed by whatever this thing was in the lake. Supposedly. So, you know, I I mean, the the natives had, had... warn the white settlers in that area about this creature and some of them took them seriously and some of them didn't and the ones that didn't lost livestock sometimes um so ogopogo has a that's a really interesting history but the the interesting part too about about this particular lake monster is that at some point um early 1900s or so the the monster went from being a monster to being kind of a mascot um for the for the local people, um, there was actually a hunting party coming from the United States that were intent on bagging Ogopogo, and the Canadians were basically like, "Yeah, you can go home, man." Yeah, you know. Now, gotta understand, Canadians are usually pretty polite and and uh, and uh, and welcoming, right? Um, they were just like, "Nope, nope, nope, you're not going to do it. Uh, this, there will be no hunting of Ogopogo here." Yeah. Good. In fact, they are so uh, adamant about this that um, um, Ogopogo is, is still, um, there was a, a provincial law passed that protect, protected Ogopogo at one time. And now the creature is actually covered under, uh, I think it's the provincial park regulations or some something, such that it's it's illegal to harm an Ogopogo <laughs> in Lake Okanagan. Um, That's awesome. To this day, to this day, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, the, um, and the thing that sparked this was that, um, there was a, a fellow who was, uh, working in an orchard, um, who spotted this critter, uh, out in the, out in the, um, out in the lake and, uh, actually took a couple of shots at it. And the, the local people were so incensed by this that they actually passed the law protecting this creature. Um, so, um. You know, again, uh, in the 70s, there was a, a very close encounter, a woman who was swimming in the lake and actually had had something that she believes was Ogopogo brush against her leg and then swim off into the uh, um, into the uh, into the depths of the lake. She described it as a as a large coil of, 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 a, of a, a creature that had a tail that reminded her of a whale. 
um, so, which has prompted some um, some of the cryptozoologists to conjecture that that Ogopogo is actually a freshwater variety of a of a, uh, a primitive whale called a zoiglodon, um, which hey, you know, um, there's certainly the possibility that a creature or creatures, you know, because there'd have to be more than one, uh, right. got trapped in those lakes during the the ice age um, ebb and flow of of water from the sea. Um, so you know, it's not completely beyond the realm of possibility. Um, it certainly seems that. Uh, this creature and the the related Cadborosaurus that lives off of the um, the Pacific coast um, are are identical or pretty similar creatures. And you know, I, I mean, who's to say? Uh, it's always been my opinion that if we were going to find an unknown species, it would be in the deep ocean. Oh, certainly. Um, I mean, there's there's, there's going to be probably thousands and thousands of them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't have a problem believing that there could be a, a, a relic primitive whale living in, you know, in a lake in British Columbia. Why not? Now, is uh, that lake open to other lakes or is it an isolated thing? Um, if I recall, um, there have been some sightings of other Ogopogo type creatures in lakes that are connected to Okanagan by, by you know, large river channels. Okay. Um, it seems to me that I remember reading that somewhere. Um, but, uh, the Okanagan is the, the primary place where, where people see this creature. The, 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 of course, the question that always comes up is, you know, it's kind of like the Bigfoot question where you say, well, if Bigfoot exists, why haven't we found a body by now? The, the lake monster mm-hmm. thing is how, how can they live in a lake and we can't find them? I mean, the ocean's one thing. <laughs> yeah. But a lake is the other thing. Yeah. And you'd figure that, you know, somebody would have caught it on sonar or, you know, cause you got all these people out there, you know, fishing, right. Yeah. And fishermen love to use those, those range finder things, the depth detectors or whatever they call them. They're basically little sonar units. You'd figure that if there was a large, more than one, there has to be more than one, right. Large creature living in the lake. Somebody would have painted it by now. Yeah. Now, now the excuse that they make in Loch Ness is, Oh, well there are underwater caverns, right? That, so you don't see these creatures, but it's like, come on, they have to come out to eat sometime. Right. Right. I mean, the other weird thing is that, and, and this is lake monsters in general across the, um, you know, across the world is that, uh, you know, I think it was Janet Colin Board point out that lake monsters are found in lakes along those same parallels of, you know, like, the Loch Ness area and a little north all across the world. Now, yeah. why would that be? Yeah. <laughs> why would that be? You know, it's like, there's a parallel. It's like, okay, this is the lake monster parallel. <laughs> exactly. You know, you, know, you know, the lake monsters live up here. And then if we go a little lower, we can, we get the, the UFOs and UAPs. And then, you know, <laughs> that is like, very okay. true. Um, you know, so because you do have, as you pointed out, there is water all over Canada. There are thousands and thousands of lakes in Canada uh, that are, have been scraped out by the glacial um, uh, by the glacial runs during the Ice Age. Um, so there's just thousands of lakes here. You know, you can't go, you know, two miles without running into water somewhere, you know, a, a creek, a river, a, a lake, a, a great lake. <laughs> you know, I don't live too far from either, you know, a couple of great lakes. Yeah, same here. Three, yeah, I mean, you're in Rochester area, so. Well, yeah, um, a little south, but yeah. A little south, of the, more Ithaca, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm about an hour from Lake Ontario. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's tons of water, um, and it's, and you, you know, there are lake monster reports all across Canada. Yeah, from British Columbia through Ontario and on into to Nova Scotia. Um, and some of those things are probably more credible than others. Oh, sure. Um, you know, but I mean, you still. And, and then, of course, and I didn't even go into Champ. You know, because obviously there's there's good research being done in that area already. I didn't really need to cover that. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, you could you could claim Champ as a Canadian lake monster too, because part of that lake is in is in Canada. Yep, yep. Uh, like half of it is in Canada. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, let's so uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish what you're saying. I mean, so you know, we have all of these lakes. We have all of these people seeing saying that they're seeing these creatures in lakes. 
Um, the interesting thing is that so many of them are different. Yeah. You know? Like, cause you go to Okanagan and you got like this sort of primitive whale type thing. You know, you go to uh, Lake Erie and, and uh, some of the lakes in, on, in Ontario and you get more of the giant snake type things. So I wonder if they're not uh, related to the, the snakes that the people are seeing in Manitoba. You know, yeah. again, you go across and, you know, go into the Atlantic and, and um, you know, you have aggressive uh, serpent type monsters that are chasing fishermen off the shore of Nova Scotia. So, yeah, they're everywhere. Well, let's let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Quick break here to uh, give you contact info and a recommendation. So if you want to uh, contact the show in general, contact at wheretheroadgo.com is the best way to do that. If you have a story you would like to submit to the listeners, story shows, stories at wheretheroadgo.com. Of course, everything can be found at wheretheroadgo.com. All our social media links are Discord, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook pages, uh, groups, everything. Uh, YouTube, and um, you can mail me stuff, snail mail-wise, at P.O. Box 444, Ovid, New York, 14521. As for a recommendation this week, I'm going to go with another podcast, this one being Vast Horizon. It's a sci-fi podcast, and it's done by Fool and Scholar Productions who do some other really cool stuff, and it's, uh, I forget how many seasons, is it three seasons, I think, at this point? And it's uh, it's very, very good, to say the least. Um, let's see. It is, uh, yeah, three seasons. So, And they have more coming, as far as I know. Very, very well done. Like I said, it's very um, interesting sci-fi. I don't want to say too much about it without giving stuff away. All right, let's, uh, let's return to talking to Travis. You are listening to Where Did the Road Go on WVBR FM Ithaca. Check us out on the web at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. You are listening to Where Did the Road Go on WVBR FM Ithaca. Check us out on the web at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. So you're listening to Where Did the Road Go, and I'm here with Travis Watson talking about not his latest book, because I'm not up to date yet, um, but this one is called Canadian Monsters and Mysteries. And uh, we're going we're gonna to end up doing a part two to this because there's so much stuff in this book I want to talk to you about. And uh, we're not even through half of it. So uh, let's talk some more about sea monsters because sea monsters, I feel like, don't get a lot of, lot of conversation going. Um, the, um, yeah. Huh? Oh, go ahead. So one of the things you, you talk about in a lot of these sightings in general, not just the sea monsters, but you, you mentioned the Oz effect, which is well known. Um, and you say you don't really see it as much with sea monsters. But one of the things you do cite is a lot of times these sea monsters are seen with quiet, calm water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the things that that, uh, that struck me as I was doing the lake monster slash sea monster um, uh, research for the for the book is that I don't think I encountered a single story where one of these creatures was spotted during a storm. Um, it seems like almost invariably, and, and I'm sure somebody can probably find a, 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 an exception to the rule, but it seemed that almost invariably these creatures were spotted on calm, fairly clear um days when uh, you know the viewing would be pretty optimal actually uh which i thought was really interesting as you know so much of the uh the paranormal the 40 and so forth seems to be taken up with you know blurry photos of things and fog weird fogs and mists and things like uh, described in mysteries in the mist and you know if you think about it the um the sort of um, general atmosphere that we often um, associate with these kinds of phenomena is that sort of foggy, misty, uh, spooky uh, kind of, um, of atmosphere, environment. Yeah. And that's not always the case, and it's particularly not the case in, with these, uh, you know, like monsters uh, and, and, and creatures of the sea. Um, it seems like they almost always appear on, on calm days. Um, and could, could that be sort of an Oz effect that we're, it's just not being noticed as much? It just seems like a calm, quiet day. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, when you talk about Randall's and the Oz effect, uh, she documents very clearly that that people, you know, pretty much lose their sense of hearing for a time. It's like right, everything just right. completely quiet. Um, I do wonder if, um, you know, I hadn't really thought about it, honestly, but I do wonder now that you, you mention it, if, if that's not a manifestation of an Oz type effect where, uh, you know, these creatures have a calming influence on, you know, the general um, seascape or waterscape around them, um, you know, or, or if they choose to appear on these really clear days. Um, there's one sea monster here from the Atlantic side of things, uh, mm-hmm. and it was called the Nanor- Nanorluk. Yeah. Um, that, that would be, I believe that was the one that was spotted off of the, uh, off the, the, the Nova Scotia coast. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. It was the, um, so yeah, very strange sighting, um, happened in early history, like 1583 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So exactly that date. Good memory. There, there, there was a, a um, ship, an explorer, um, who was making his way over to, um, you know, over to the new world and then coming back. And, uh, they spotted this thing, uh, which they, they described as being like a lion in the water. <laughs> uh, you know, i it's very difficult to understand the description of this creature from the, the recorded log. It sounds almost like, you know, they were witnessing a giant lion walking on the sea bottom um, and and it just kind of walks by their ship Um, and they're looking at this thing and, and, you know, of course, nobody knows what to make of this and they're wondering if this is some kind of native wildlife to the new world. (laughs) The thing is absolutely immense, apparently, and, uh, you know, they're they're just not sure what to make of it. But the the really weird part about that story is that uh, not... say nine days later, their ship, which has the bizarre name of the squirrel, um, actually uh, hits an iceberg and and goes down uh, with all hands. And before it goes down, uh, people who, uh, another ship that was accompanying them, the the explorer guy was said to be sitting out on the on the bow of the ship, just uh, speaking, you know, just in, in kind of strange and incoherent terms about life and death and, and, and so forth. So, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's almost as though seeing this creature had, um, uh, you know, set him aback, uh, you know, given him such a psychological shock that he wasn't able to deal. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you, know, you do wonder about that because you do hear occasionally about people having a paranormal encounter who, you know, suffer breakdowns Yes, um, because they're, they're so traumatized by it or, or just does such a job on their, on their paradigm, their, their world paradigm that they can't deal with it. Uh, there was another one here where you, that the, the officers that saw it described it as a sh- sea giraffe with giant blue eyes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the watch officers uh, who who documented this thing, it's like, okay, we're you know, first we get a lion, you know, what what looks like a giant lion pedaling through the the ocean, um, and 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 scaring the crap out of people on a sailing ship, and then later on we get this fellow that that's reporting, yeah, it's a, it's like a giraffe, and it's walking along. Uh, or swimming along, or whatever it was doing, except that the giraffe has baby blue eyes. It's like you got to wonder where that perception comes from. <laughs> right, right, and that was, <laughs> and that was 1913. This isn't a report from yeah, like the 1500s yeah, was, or anything. Fairly, yeah, this, that was fairly. Uh, you know, it's not like you know you had the the 1500s where people were you know more superstitious or supposedly more superstitious and more likely to. to create fantastic stories. This is the 13, 1913 when, you know, people were, you know, really getting into the whole scientific materialist paradigm. So this yeah. thing must've thrown them for a loop when they saw it. <laughs> and it let out a, ba- a sound like a baby crying when it turned away. Yeah. And doesn't that give you some, some pause because how many times have we heard stories of Sasquatches or, 
you know, other creatures of the night making sounds like babies crying to yep. attract people into the woods, right? The yeah, fae. exactly. Yeah. So that, that stood yeah. out a lot to me. Yeah, you have to wonder if it wasn't some kind of a water, uh, uh, water fay creature. Oh, certainly could be, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you have a number of uh, stories here about aggressive sea serpents as well. Yeah, the Sable Island monster, yeah. Um, there were a couple of these stories, but, but basically, you know, you had a, a series of sightings uh, where these fishermen off the coast of, uh, of Nova Scotia were running across this very aggressive serpent type creature um basically gave chase to their boats um they would uh, there was there was one of these um one of these sightings where uh, one fellow was uh, was a father and son if i recall where the the son sees this thing coming and uh he pretty much freezes up he's, he's like he sees this this giant serpent thing coming toward the back of the boat you know, it's kind of like that scene from Jaws where, <laughs> where he comes back in and he's like, we need a bigger boat. Um, I think he probably felt like they needed a bigger boat at, at that particular moment because he's he uh, must have made a sound or something. And his dad turns and sees this thing and just, you know, uh, puts the, the, the throttles to the stops. And, and the, the son was convinced that he saved their lives doing that because this thing was going to crash onto the back of their boat. Um, they fled from this thing. It chased them, and they only lost it by uh, by moving into shallower waters. Um, so, and there were a couple of, of those stories where uh, where this this particular uh, serpent. Uh, most of the sea serpent sightings that you get are very kind of calm. You know, the the end of, you know the captain will be looking out over the water with his binoculars or whatever. And he'll see this thing in the distance, or it'll swim by their boat or whatever. But it doesn't normally interact with the the vessels at all. This yeah. particular yeah. one, though, for whatever reason, uh, you know, was extremely aggressive, but only for a short period of time, and then. You know, things went back to normal. Um, there were there was a, a particular area of uh, the coastline there that that the fishermen avoided for a while until uh, whatever this was went back to wherever it came from. And and you you point out that you know like it's one thing for wolves or something to be uh, territorial, but sea sea creatures generally aren't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure again that that, that there's someone who can come up with an exception to the rule. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, for the most part, you know, like I said, most of your uh, sightings, uh, you know, unless you're talking about the kraken, <laughs> yeah, most of your sight of, of these these anomalous sea creatures are just that. They're sightings. You know, they see this thing swimming by. They'll observe it for a while. Uh, you know, maybe they'll even follow it for a little bit. But most of these things seem to be pretty harmless. Um, but then you have this one. Uh, critter that decided that it didn't like fishing boats for whatever reason. You have to wonder if if it was, uh, you know, if there was a situation where the motors of the boat were disturbing young or, uh, you know, something along that line. You know, if we take the uh, the uh, cryptozoological viewpoint that uh, you know, some of these creatures might be giant sea, uh, giant um, eels or, or or even giant pinnipeds, uh, you know, then they must reproduce. And, you know, if you happen to wander into their, their, uh, their mating grounds, then that might be cause for a, a, an aggressive display. That's but true. Again, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, and sea serpents are not, you know, I don't know. Like you don't hear them talked about that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's interesting that, um, you know, for a while, uh, any any Fordian book that you picked up, you know, like I said, yeah, Strange World or Stranger Than Science or some of the Keel book or whatever, you know, there was usually some sea monster stories in those, and and there were some there were some good uh, books written back in the sixties and seventies that talked all about historical sea monster sightings and so forth. But yeah, sea monsters are not in vogue now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it's like everybody's into Sasquatch. Right? You know, it's like Sasquatch is a big thing. Sasquatch and Dogman and, and all that sort of thing. It's, you know, I predicted a while back that uh, there was going to be a, 
a renaissance of uh, you know sightings of, of things in the sky, and lo and behold, we had this uh, this whole wave of Mothman type sightings in the Chicago land area. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, because it's just you know it's like these things like UFO flaps, you know, it's like people will not see a UFO for, you know, five years. And then all of a sudden some, there will be like 30 sightings in a particular area. You know, it seems like that sort of thing has happened, happens with these anomalous phenomena, you know, in general. And yeah. right now just is not the time of sea monsters. Apparently. <laughs> um, I, I think it's just, I think more it's just that there's not that much interest in sea monsters and people can't just go out sea monster hunting like they can Bigfoot hunting. Yeah. Or ghost that. hunting. Yeah. You know, that's that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's it's much more difficult to um to deal with um uh trying to or well, I mean even the people who you know, the people who look for lake monsters have to be pretty dedicated to and have boats and sonar equipment and all that yeah. kind of stuff. You know, it's much more um, cost intensive than, uh, you know, like, you know, you can go looking for Bigfoot with, you know, backpacking gear. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. You don't even need that. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I can drive a couple of hours and be up in prime Bigfoot com- country, country. So, you know. Yeah, the, the 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 way flaps work have always fascinated me because I mean, there's there's obviously a key to whatever this is in that data. It's just a matter of figuring out what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I mean, someday somebody smarter than me may figure it out, but I, right now I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we probably don't have enough data. I mean, I think if we had enough data, somebody would have figured it out. I think that we're still missing stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's an argument to be made for you know establishing a Fortean database, but I don't know who would do it. Yeah. First of all, you know who had the the technical skills to do it, and then you have the problem with uh, with bias. Yes. You know, yeah. you know, as we discussed before the show started, there are certain other databases where you know if you report one way, then it makes it into the database, but if you report another way, it doesn't. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, so you'd have to have, you know, a group of people that were willing to just say, okay, what the witness says is what the witness says and get it all down. Yes. You know? <clears throat> and then make it easy to cross reference. Yeah, yeah. And that would be the tough part. I mean, phew. well, um, we're just about out of time. We're going to do a second part to this probably next week. Um, okay. we'll talk about a couple of things in the Patreon segment, but for now, tell people, well, tell people what books you have out and where they can get them okay. and your online presence. Okay. So I have four nonfiction, uh, you know, paranormal slash 40 books out. There's Phantom Black Dogs, Walkers of the Liminal Way, which is about the Phantom Black Dog apparition, um, which it doesn't just exist in England as a lot of people think. Uh, there's also sightings here in Canada and in the United States and even in South America, Central America. Um, my second book was Mysteries in the Mist, which is about mist, fog, and clouds and the paranormal. Um, we've been talking about Canadian monsters and mysteries tonight, um, and that's a compendium of, of weirdness from Canada. And my latest book is Sasquatch Canada Beyond British Columbia, which is a, a, a sort of an overview of Sasquatch sightings in, uh, in Canada outside of the very common things that we hear about in British Columbia. Um, you know, everybody talks about Harrison Hot Springs and, and those areas in British Columbia. Obviously, you could probably write a whole book about sightings in that area because uh, they're thick on the ground. Um, I wanted to see if there were Sasquatch sightings in other parts of Canada. And indeed, there are. Um, and in fact, I found sightings in every province in Canada except for none of it. Um, <clears throat> except so, for what? Except for none of it, uh, oh. which is far north. It's uh, mostly Inuit territory. Ah. Um, so, um, as far as, so you will find me on Amazon, uh, find my books on Amazon. They're available as Kindle eBooks and they're also available as, uh, as paperbacks, of course. Um, if you have Kindle Unlimited, they're free. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, you can't beat that. Um, <clears throat> as far as social media goes, I'm on Facebook as, uh, WT Watson, uh, author page. Um, also if you want to follow me personally, I'm Will Watson. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at WT Watson two 
And on uh, Instagram, this is the weird one, at Curanir, C-U-R-U-N-I-R-6-0, which is an old handle um, that, um, that I use. Um, so, you know, I'm always happy to have other followers and always happy to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to tell. Um, and again, uh, all the books are under, I go by Travis, but all the books are under W.T. Watson. So, All right. Well, thank you, and we'll we'll continue this in another segment, and we'll do a quick Patreon segment for Patreon. So thank you, Travis. Thank you so much, Soraya. It was nice talking with you. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons and give a special shout-out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Billuminati, Chuck Shutters, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Indrid Cold, 36 Dingo, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris, Greg Cicernos, Greg Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Todd, J, J Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Ole Andre Olar, Patricia W, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varoche K, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, and Ren Collier. Thank you all so very, very much. So there is a Patreon segment to this that will go up later in the week for patrons and uh, a part two coming next week with Travis. So uh, if you like this, there's a, there's a bunch more to come. All right. I want to welcome some new patrons. Um, JFE1138, Andy Chapel, Indrid Cold, Diona Bidwell, and Liz and Olivia Emmons. Thank you all for joining up and helping to support the show. Again, everything Where Did the Road Go related can be found at Um, All our social media, links to everything and shows going all the, all the way back to the very first one over 10 years ago now. So, all right. I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>